Good evening. Thank you so much, Strelka and the Higher School of Economics and Oxfam for inviting me tonight. I'm extremely happy to present here in Moscow. It's a great opportunity. I should say that this is not my first presentation ever in Moscow. In 1987, I was performing at the scene of the Kremlin Palace as a part of the musical group of folk dance of Latvian uh, Soviet Republic, but that was a different genre. I didn't have to speak. I was a little girl. But today I will present the presentation in the Russian language for the first time. It would be easier to do that in English, but I believe since I'm in Russia, I should try to speak the language and do not bottom everything down to English language in academic communication. That is why please forgive me for my grammar mistakes. Please forgive me for looking at the text. I even have some stresses in the words. I should also congratulate all of the graduates. Today is the graduation day, and specifically I want to con congratulate one graduate, the, the lady who's here in the audience, thank you very much for making it and congratulations. So we have all heard that urban population of the planet Earth is constantly increasing. By 2030, 60% of humanity will be living in cities. Simultaneously, more and more people, uh, um, I mean, there are more and more megapolises, meaning cities with a population over one million people, especially in the global south. But in between those megapolises, there are cities and towns which lose the population, lose the investment potential and the interest from the government. Many cities, many urban areas are not growing but shrinking, and most of them are Surprisingly, in Europe, the deserted villages in Italy are joined by ghost towns in Russia, empty resorts in England, and empty factory towns in Latvia. All of this are villages, settlements, which are abandoned by the city, or city has not reached them yet. What do I mean when I'm saying that the city has left or have not reached that place yet? I define the city not as a specially limited uh, notion, because there is a city, urban agglomeration, and metropolitan area, megapolis. I would define city as the concentration of things and relationships, such as infrastructures, services, municipal services, social links, time rhythms, cultural preferences, and political orientations. City is the nod in the continuum of relationships. So, sometimes these relationships that construct a city disappear. So, as a result, cities become less urban or become even non-cities or under-cities. For example, the citizens of Latvia that move from villages into uh, English market towns often complain that they lose the city, the feeling of the city, meaning social life, cultural life. Those are kind of a under cities, in complete cities. Simultaneously, some cities become global. Saski Sassen integrated this term recently. A global city is a city that concentrates power. It's the city where the future is being constructed. A few decades ago, they could not foresee that. In the first years of neoliberal uh, globalization, they believed that uh, production will leave big cities and that will leave, lead to decline of the cities. But financial markets have been becoming more and more significant in global production and global economy, and that made cities a command center of global economics. But if we take a look at what is happening outside of megapolises, we would see that while global cities are growing, urbanized spaces overall are shrinking, specifically in former socialist regions where modernization meant building new cities and constructing villages into town villages. So it's not about 
target urbanization, but re-urbanization, which consists of urbanization and de-urbanization. So the space outside of global towns allows to see the roughness of this landscape because re-urbanization is a part of global space and time configuration of capitalist economy, which also includes the so-called land preservation land capturing that turn these uh, unurbanized spaces into the areas of uh, large-scale agricultural production. Most of us have been brought up with modernist ideology with endless growth of production, be it socialistic uh, or capitalistic production. So for us, it's hard to think about shrinking or um, desertion as something that is happening, actually happening. Most of the politicians or consultants in terms of uh, regional development think in terms of cycles of growth. For example, in China, out of 90 cities that lose population, 70 cities are still increasing construction and preparing to increase population in the future. In Germany, for example, they begin speaking about drying out cities and controllable decline. In Latvia, for example, where during independence the population is increased by 25%, and that is a trend that is still going on. This tryout and decline would not be, are not the part of regional or national planning. As a result, lots of regional plans of development bottom down to just preservation of infrastructure and to the hope that people would sometime return to those deserted places. For example, the government of Latvia has a very strong plan for remigration, but lots of people, lots of experts are scared to speak about desertion and depopulation because that is considered to be um, beneficial for, for pro-Russian propaganda in Latvia. The disbelief in growth is considered to be non-patriotic. It's politically dangerous to speak about it. People are holding on to the ideas that are not often in favor of wealth of the nation. London Berlandon, a British uh, sociologist, is calling it cru cruel uh, optimism. I'd say even violent optimism. But people live outside of megapolises and somehow structure their existence. Let's talk about that. Somehow those people imagine the future. So what does it look like living in those stricken spaces of post-industrial world when modernization projects of endless inclusion of new places and new territories and people lose their sense and strength and they are pulled down or um, uh, they're replaced by expulsion as Saski assassins say. So let us get acquainted with two cities connected with migration, one in England and another one in Latvia. 24th of July 2016, next day after a Brexit referendum, I woke up at the verge of Europe, technically, the heart of British agriculture, the city, the town of Boston in Lincolnshire, where 75% of people, and that is the biggest percentage in Great Britain, voted for Brexit. Since the broadening of the European Union, the people, uh, the, the amount of population in Boston born outside of England grew by over 670%. Of course, everybody connects that to the uh, referendum. So how did that happen? After the distribution of supermarkets and the restructurization, restructuring of agriculture, local farmers decreased the production cost, they have established non-stop delivery of products and actually conducted very strict standardization. Some of them even built packing production, but those niches between agriculture production and supermarkets were filled by extra packaging centers. The supply, I mean, the demand for seasonal workers was replaced by workers, cheap workforce that will be always present. If before seasonal workers from Sheffield and Ireland were coming for seasonal work, but before the broadening of agriculture, 
Labor agencies were actively inviting uh, workers from Eastern Europe. The first settlers were joined by the rest. They were living in a wagon or in an apartment with several people in one room, and they were getting uh, a minuscule um, salary lower than the minimal wage. They were getting uh, 3.5 pounds with minimal wage of 7.25 pounds, so lower than cost of living. The average income has decreased by 25%. Property owners, many of which did not live in Boston, increased uh, the rent. So Boston become with the largest, become the city with the largest population, largest growing uh, foreign population, the strongest cuts to budget, the lowest average salary, and the highest rent in Eastern Midlands in England. Really few of the citizens of town agreed to the arguments of liberal that there are economic benefits of immigration. They were living at the periphery of Great Britain and uh, at the edge of Europe. In June 2018, I woke up at the other end of Europe. I was in some time in once vivid town village, three kilometers away from the border between <laughs> Latvia and Russia. This village grew in the middle of the 19th century by the station, by the railroad station between Warsaw and Peterburg. So I will just call this uh, settlement Mansips. I call Boston Boston because it's a well-known case and it's a big town, so you will not be able to identify particular people. So, so the first settlers of Masians arrived from villages around and other regions of the Russian Empire. Railroad workers, engineers, doctors, and their husbands and wives. Railroad uh, management brought water purifying stations, schools, and after Second World War, the number of population there decreased radically. Some informants who were kids back then now recall how everyone all of the Jews vanished all of a sudden. But after the war, the growth of the population restarted and new settlers entered the deserted houses. One woman shared that her parents were the members of the Soviet uh, Bridge Building Brigade, who actually decided to end up living in Masians and settled down there. Some settlers from the region of Pskov paid local uh, administrations to get registration. Most of the people did not register officially, though. Later on, people from uh, country villages, uh, country houses uh, from Leningrad were going there and buying houses there. Residents love to recall happy childhood of 60s and 70s with donuts and Indian movies in uh, train cinemas on wheels. Today, Masians is almost completely deserted. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, kolkhozes and um, all of the productions were closed, disbanded, and the last passenger train passed village three years ago. There are workplaces only in local administrations, shops, and uh, um, some small local businesses. There are a few farmers, local farmers, who are successful, but their production is automated, and they're very meticulous in selecting their workers, often preferring to bring workers from far away, but not taking local workers. But Masians in Boston are connected to the movement of the population from one place to another. This is a woman who moved from Masians to Boston, but soon she divorced and returned back. She inherited from her mother the position of station worker at the railroad station. She meets uh, the rare cargo trains that meet at the local 
station and register at the local customs office because Mastiens is the first customs station at the border. The daughter, uh, grand daughter and grand granddaughter of this woman live in a small town near Boston. You see, there are photos from the outer world on the shelf of this lady. He is wearing this velvet coat and a tie. He doesn't speak Latin. But on Christmas he said one thing, Vats mamin estevi lubete, to her grand-grandmother. That means, grandmother, I love you so, so much. Movement from Mustians to Boston is inherent for the mainstream of migration. That was followed by Latvia entering the EU in 2004. Actual additional stimulus was the financial crisis of 2008 and the regime of a thorough economy that led to lots of businesses uh, defaulting and uh, closing. So there was a strong exit, exit of the population. Lots of people were living to collect cabbages, crop, strawberries in Britain, Norway, and those young people were followed by their parents, grandparents, etc. The difference between Mustangs and Boston is this, this great outcome was happening between two towns which are at the periphery of Europe, unequally integrated into global circulation of capital. In the case of Latvia, the transformation of periphery is connected to geopolitical reorientation. Latvia and its citizens have moved from western periphery of the Soviet Union into the eastern periphery of Europe. That is a metamorphosis that was both symbolic and material, and it's connected to uh, radical change, radical and very quick change of status. Here's an illustration. In 50 years, there were these sack carriers, the migrants from the Soviet Union who were going to uh, Riga railway station and they were really and they were really assaulting, bombarding local shops. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs used these um, photos to show the problems of national minorities in Brussels, to show vulnerability of the position of the Latvian population as the majority in Latvia. Uh, today, these kind of photos, I use British media to show all of this migrants from the Eastern Europe who invade Britain. But instead of standing in lines to shop, they open their own shops, invading the cultural space. Boston's um, older generation show these photos, talk about these photos as about uh, as symbols of um, foreign invasion. But for most people born after the war, this is a new experience. But there are people like Zhenia. He's 40 years old from Latvia, and he's a migrant of both peripheries, both ages, both Soviet and European. His mother grew up in the country of Belarus, in a small village of four towns. Evgeny has um, three sisters. Two of them are in Latvia, one in Moscow. Evgeny says, in our family, there are two generations of migrants living. This is in our blood. His mother cannot come to him in to him to uh, England because she doesn't have Latvian citizenship, citizenship because she has not been naturalized. She lived in Latvia most of her life, 40 years, but the last 15 years she is learning Latvian language, but he, she, she has not been yet able to pass the exam. Evgeny cannot comment uh, the attitude uh, to her mother in Latvia, but he sometimes says that there is hostility to her mother from the Englishman in Boston. That's understandable, Evgeny says. It's hard, it's not cool. He does love that when drunk people in Boston and, uh, spit on the pavement, speaking Russian and standing in the way of pedestrians. He is ashamed for those people. Similarly, there is an, the similar is the opinion of a Latvian citizen who lives in Boston at the dame of her friend. I wanted to talk to more people and I talked to two ladies who were just going down the bridge and speaking Latvian at this spot. And all of a sudden I heard Latvian speech. Look at them, look at them, standing in the middle of pavement like savages. Can you just move away aside and let other people pass? Because of people like you, they hate us here. So, I calmed down from the shock. I retired from the shock. 
Я догнала возмущенную женщину, I которая представилась как Скайбрита и очень доброжелательная. Объяснила мне, что у нас слишком много, и что себя вести. And Времена lots of people don't know Теперь how to behave. Times have changed. Now we are the savages not respecting local customs. Now there's too many of us. So Nassim has become empty and Boston is overfilled. There's too many of Latvians there. But this juxtaposition is not entirely fair because there's emptiness even in the places that are filled with people, specifically if those places are forgotten and abandoned. But let's go back to Nassim. In 2004, when I began dealing with migration from Latvia, Yeah. Lots of the people I've been talking to were quickly leading conversation to desertion and abandonment, both in the Riga and small towns and villages in Latvia. People were showing deserted houses and apartments, and they were listing the friends and relatives who left the country. In the villages, they specifically, in rural areas, were talking about dwindling infrastructure. After 1990, 34 railway routes were shut down. 11 routes were completely dismantled, starting with 2009, after the Ministry of Education declared that school network will be optimized. 171 schools were closed, and many of the schools that remained were connected and joined to other regions. Lots of residents of Latvia, lots of citizens of Latvia, see future as some alien world where there is no place for them. Some people say that wild nature is returning. Some people say that the Chinese will come back, will invade, buy everything and build everything by their own image. Desertion and emptiness is the key subject of the conversation about changing social life. This rhetoric of emptiness, the end of the world that as we know it, there are some individual trajectories that are being built. Some Some people are saying about migration into the places where time flows the way we know it and where honest labor leads to better work, better work leads to higher salary, etc., etc. Others, however, stay where they are, stitch their life together out of the spots of remaining life and try to make tomorrow similar to today. Somebody else prefers the freedom that declares the end of the world. Last summer, девяносто-двухлетняя опустел. Раньше было 30 коров, говорит она, а сейчас только одна осталась. И как я потом узнала, в Мастемсе действительно осталась только одна корова, но она не дает молока, она, как и ее хозяйка, ушла в пенсию. Конец света наступает постепенно, рывками и с отступлениями. Несколько лет назад женщина с 40 с небольшим, которую ее назову Илза, купила в Мастемсе два пустых дома, один для себя и один для семи брата. Она заплатила по 200 евро за каждый, но ей пришлось протратить много времени и несколько euros денег на то, чтобы кому официально, официально принадлежит эти дома и оформить этот процесс приватизации. Она решила переехать из Мастемса, потому что до этого ее семья жила в советском центре в городском поселке. Начала делать на дом, на дому маникюр и педикюр женщинам из соседного городка и устроилась на работу почтальон. Ее муж работал в Эстонии. Когда мы снова встретились в 2018 году, летом, она сказала, что думает уйти с работы в почтовом отделении. 
Она разводила почту на собственной машине и информила, которой почтовая служба пользуется для определения амортизации, по ее словам, не соответствует уровню повреждения отъезды по сельским дорогам. Почтовая служба не вкладывала деньги в материальную базу без людей в сельских кого-нибудь из остающихся жителей. Милла захотела стать косметологом на постоянной основе, но чувствовала себя виноватой. To become Кто же будет привозить старушкам их несчастные письма и газеты? Как же, как родители автолавки, которые приезжают по пятницам себе в убыток и вышедшие на пенсию мисс Эстра, которые лечат своих соседей, Илза считала себя членом импровизированной семьи, которая нуждалась в ее учебе. И все таки в конце лета она уехала. Уехала в Германию, ухаживать за престарелыми за 2000 евро в месяц. Жизнь, которая оказалась вместе с ней, вернулась в поселок, так же внезапно кончилась. Будущее означало ориентацию на смерть оставшихся жителей и самого поселка. Тем временем местные власти составляли планы развития регионов. В соседнем поселке состоялась публичная обсуждение. Хотя детей оставалось мало, и никто не сомневался, что земельник будет продолжаться возвращаться, было решено, что здание школы не должно прийти в упад. Школа закрылась годом ранее и стояла в пустая. Говорили о том, можно ли превратить ее в клуб. Кто-то сказал, что надо наконец построить детскую площадку, которая была включена в предыдущий план. Построить значит публично заявить, что будущее не потеряно. Логика развития, гарантированная на рост, противоречит плану управления пустотой. Глава местной администрации сказал мне, что его главная задача — собрать налоги на имущество и понять, как быть с разваливающимся зданием. Дело сложное тем, что никто не знает, кому эти дома принадлежат. На юридическом языке они являются домами, не установленные принадлежности. Но, например, в 70-е годы купил права на аренду дома, а в 90-е не приватизировал его из-за недостатка денег, отсутствия интереса и эмиграции. Такие потенциальные владельцы числятся не в официальных кадастрах, а в социальной памяти. У местных властей нет средств ни для того, чтобы найти законных владельцев, с тем, чтобы потребовать обслуживания зданий, ни для того, чтобы сами эти здания снести. Вслед за людьми, зданиями, инфраструктурой исчезают Buildings and infrastructure points on the map also disappeared. Starting with 2001, when local property registry began to register those local villages, the number of villages in Latvia decreased by 2,700. As defined as units of territory with certain concentrations of infrastructure and buildings, the number of villages in Latvia decreased by 2,700. As defined as units of territory with certain concentrations of infrastructure and buildings, the number of villages in Latvia decreased by 2019. Когда я вышла из гостиницы в день hotel, по Брекзиту, казалось, что за каждым day, жителем следовал like журналист с микрофоном. В тот день Бостон был переполнен, и именно об этом говорить журналистам. Для политиков, говорящих голов, главным индикатором тесноты является статистика многократного увеличения процента жителей, многолетных жителей в первую очередь, was the statistics of increase of the population coming from other countries. Некоторые бостонцы, называющие себя коренными, то есть индейцами, жителями, и известными под этим названием различных официальных документов. жаловались на ухудшение языковой ситуации. Зайдешь в магазин. Поздороваешься и не знаешь, что тебе поможет. Ходили слухи о том, что местные дети приходят вместе в школу на такси, потому что в районах школах не осталось места. Хотя, если верить местной статистике, мест 
in schools in the nearing neighborhood. However, according to the stats, there are enough spots, but stats had no relation to this feeling of alienation, overpopulation that was felt by local born and bred Bostonians. This overcrowdedness, this overcrowding met this push away and desertedness. The center of Boston was deserted because local people were not going there. People used to come to markets, local corner stores. Now there are no stores because there are East European shops there now. Now if you want to have dinner outside of your home, Cindy was telling me, you need to go outside of town. That's because of migrants. The city is empty. There is nothing left. Nobody goes out anymore. In one of the interviews, she even said that the town is both empty and overcrowded. This feeling that this um, overcrowdedness, overpopulation is going hand in hand with the climate here, not only to those people who thought that they're victims of global migration, but the farmers there told me that the lack of local workers is a symptom of a broader problem. People of Boston were looking for better life outside of Boston. Those who live, Маленькие those who remain, don't want to live and follow by the rules of the, the live by the rules of supermarkets. If East Europeans would stop coming there, all of the food Fermi. production will actually Есть, collapse. East Europeans allow the system to survive, survive the system that surrendered all of the power to the capital. There are complaints that the British don't want to do the job that use Europeans do. And these complaints drive away attention. From the revolution led by the supermarket food production. First of all, local small farmers were excluded from the production chain. And secondly, workers don't have any guarantees for uh, social uh, guarantees. Interestingly, that this feeling of overcrowded, uh, overcrowding in total emptiness is common there. Migrants would probably feel different, but as a matter of fact, most of the migrants that I've been talking about, talking with, believe that the city has become so much better when they come. Now there are shops, young taxpayers have come to the city, and now there is good social infrastructure for elderly populations. So migrants still think that Bostonians do not appreciate the migrants coming and don't understand what would happen if Brexit would end up migration. Yanni said that in a couple of years we'll just move to Scotland and nothing will be here. West Street will be completely deserted. This fullness of life is very fragile. That's why he said it. But if emptiness moved on temporarily, another emptiness has remained. Boston lacks civilization. Yana has told me that the only reason, the only thing that he is missing, going back to Latvia, would be his high salary. At home, he plays basketball, goes to the theater, to the stadium. Here at Boston, there is one theater, and nothing is happening there. Maybe once a month, they would stage something. That's what his friend Laura says. She wanted to go to the dancing club or yoga club, but she hasn't been able to find anything. There's nothing here, she says. And she uses Soviet formula from the other context, saying that Valery, the hairdresser from Lodzi, the city 20 kilometers away from Lodzi, he says, they promised us that England is posh and we were going to see this newly made apartments and everything, very well, newly repaired, but it's just a uh, garbage place and totally ass here. Boston seems to be deserted, and local elites would agree, David and Emma, the British, who moved to Boston to get retired, call this city, call this city, 
underdeveloped, lagging and deserted. They say that there is very poor bus traffic and you cannot really leave the city. There is no mobility and connection to other parts of England and the city is cultural desert. Nothing is happening there. That's what the old-timers of Boston say. At least nothing was happening before, up until 75% of the voters voted for uh, Brexit. Emptiness is must be not imaginary. It's everywhere. And this emptiness is filled by wild nature. This blooming uh, apple trees. But in Boston, the emptiness is relative. For somebody, it's present, but for the others, it's absent. Boston's emptiness is filled with monsters. The vote reminded British public that before becoming the capital of Brexit, Boston was the capital of Great Britain. It has the largest number of murders per 100,000 people and the largest share of population with obesity. ITV channel, which has just launched the new TV series called Wild Bill, and the movie states in Boston, Ryan Lowe is a British cop who goes to the local police office to shake things up, and there are Oleg and other character. There's Oleg, another character played by Dmitry from Yugoslavia. There are also actors, Russian associates, a Russian opera singer, and so on and so forth. All of the villains are Russians. No villains from Latvia. So this is a shot from a trailer. This cop, this policeman throwing a piece of cabbage. First time when I told my colleagues that I went to Boston, and everyone was from what I am from the ocean. When they, when I told my friends that I am going to Boston, they thought I am going to Boston, America. In the eyes of mass media, Boston has become a provincial city. The unknowable has changed because of the influx of migrants. It is a city that is obsolete and changed by migrants. It defines. Great space between London, which is market city, and Boston, and there is this gap which symbolizes the lack of civilization. Boston is a place that was not yet reached by this big city of London. It must be emptiness. Looks as something deserted. The civilization has abandoned this place. This is aesthetically beautiful. Journalists go to Mustians looking for desertion and emptiness as a process. One of the writers photographers described his perfect aesthetic object as the cup of coffee on a table and the oven that is still warm. He wanted to catch the moment when the closing library, when they take out the books out of the closing library and put the lock on the door of the school. Before becoming the abyssity capital and desertion capital, discrimination capital and Brexit capital, Boston used to be a typical market town of Great Britain, a local center of agricultural production. As one local historian said, market towns are connected by the spots which you could reach on a chariot. Boston used to be even the character of the propaganda town about uh, supply of the products to the war that was during the war, Second World War. This town was a protector of Great Britain and in, um, in far past uh, the port town with connection to Italy and Genoa. Today, this uh, port has been privatized. Let's stay here. Today, the port is privatized, and it functions independently from the city. None of my friends, of the people I was interviewing, knew what the port does. All that I was able to find out that is that privatization uh, happened in the 90s. It belongs now to the Victoria Group that owns six ports on the shore of England. 
not connected to Latvia at all. Overall, for both the neoliberal globalization meant the breaking of connections. The same is fair to Muslims. Integration to uh, market, free market to liberal, liberal democracy means uh, tearing down of the connection to Russia and uh, different logics for social and political life. Passenger, uh, passenger railroad connection actually contradicted the logic. Less and less people who work in local railway station due to the, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. Having found out as uh, increasing isolation, local elites were going to preserve uh, symbolic connections trying to work in the history of their local window into the world, which are ports and port and railway stations. But they cannot bring, the, uh, bring back to life those monuments of the monuments of industrial life. So they move those objects into some, some kind of symbols of heritage. The citizens of Boston, they want to get separated from the provincial majority, founded the Boston uh, General Group and actually entered the alliance of the former uh, uh, Yenzian uh, towns, changing the image of the town uh, into the image of the town that is open to the world. And they want to get rid of this label of uh, cultural desert. They want to rewrite the history of migration. And actually, the Poles the poles of the uh, city hall in Boston came from Latvia. Muslims, they want to restore historic connection by preserving a memory of the railroad station. The order recently to the official historian of the uh, Latvian railroads, the material history of the railroad station, and actually uh, read the so-called Talka, the uh, traditional day when uh, local residents come together to clean the space of the station after privatization. Some people were speaking about the museum that could be created there, but they don't know who would go to that museum yet. Yet few residents of Mustians live just the way we can and try to build the new space. The only connection to the world to, to them is migration. The citizens of Boston re-established connections in a different way. They voted to separate themselves from Europe, and that's how they are going to take back the control. Really few people want to can explain how that actually would work. Together with the global towns, global cities that became the common centers for local capital, deserted towns and villages, settlements, fight for spatial logics of uh, contemporary capitalism. That logic is not always coherent because desertion, same as urbanization, is a process that is not uh, homogeneous. Some places retain, regain new life because rich investors might buy the Italian village, but the group of um, the group of uh, the group of summer residents, cottagers, uh, can actually build, build a settlement somewhere. This developed urbanism according to which innovation solutions can uh, lower the effect of uh, the negative effect of distance uh, of towns or even make an advantage. But the global trend is that many spots like this would never go back to life in this paradigm of uh, the growth of the 20th century. Even smart design ideas that is trying to rethink traditional landscape, for example, this project of Italy and Belgium of its horizontal Megapolis with the integration of rural and urban spaces has some very large blank spots. One of those spots is very well known for, to everybody. That is most of Russia. Although I think that's more of a result of current geopolitical situation with the urban planning. First and foremost, I'm curious about these blank spots because they are not yet a frontier or something incorporated into contemporary space planning. They are actually 
a structural part of it. In other words, they are not, this is, we're not talking about the history of one or another. This is the history of both, both the growth and decline of urbanization and deurbanization, emptiness and overcrowding. This is the, the process of urbanization when local deserted villages and agricultural areas become a part of something that Neil Grenley and Christian Schmidt call global urban fabric, worldwide urban fabric, which is connected directly to the logics of uh, uh, contemporary capitalism. Boston and Mustangs are productive spots to study both. Неизвестно, как сельскохозяйственное производство и упаковочные центры изменят жизнь в Empty field or woods, but we do know that future comes as a result of decisions made not only in New York and London, but also in Boston and Massachusetts. Thank you so much for your attention.